This weekend we're commemorating a important and auspicious divine event, which I'll speak about more later on. The main point of this weekend is simply to keep our mind in Guru and in Radha Krishna as much as possible, constantly. So through singing this Pad Kirtan and hearing a short explanation of it, we'll try to engross our mind in thinking of God and Guru. Bali Shri Guru Dev Kripal Ki My Divine Guru is so gracious and I realize and appreciate this. Therefore, I sacrifice my whole being upon Him. Bali means I give my everything. I completely surrender myself and sacrifice myself. Guru is the very form of grace. God's will is manifested practically as His grace. What is the will of God? Well, the will of God means he has a desire for something. His will is to make that thing happen. What is that thing? Souls should attain divine bliss. So how does he make that happen? Through the power of his grace. His nature is grace. Just like it's the nature of the sun to give sunlight, it's the nature of God to be gracious. So, it's His will for souls to attain divine bliss. Therefore, everything that God does, everything that Radha and Krishna do, is only to grace the souls. It includes manifesting the universe. It includes manifesting the Ved and other divine scriptures. It includes sending saints on earth to guide the souls, and it includes taking avatar himself in order to inspire and guide the souls. So the Guru is a part of God's gracious activity, and actually Guru is the very medium of that power of grace. When we say the will of God, God's will must have a force behind it. God is satya sankalpaha. Whatever God decides happens. So God, God's very thought has a force behind it. That force is His grace. It's a power. So that grace is felt and experienced in the heart of the devotees. It's that grace that has the power to eliminate the bondage of maya. And it's that grace that causes divine bliss to be given to a soul. That very same grace is given to the ordinary souls through the medium of the guru. The guru is the agent or the deliverer of that grace, that kripa. So when we say Shri Guru Dev Kripa Laki, Kripa means Kripalu, gracious. My Guru is the very form of divine grace and is the medium of my receiving that divine grace. Now the Guru helps us in many ways. In the first line, Shri Maharaji mentions one very important way that the Guru's grace is given and experienced in this world. So he says, Jinike Divya Vachan His words, the actual words, whether they be writing or speech of the Divine Guru, well, his words are also divine. So because of their effect, Sunni, the one who hears or reads those words, Chutat Granthi Avidya Jalaki, the knot 
of my ignorance, the knot of spiritual confusions that resides in everybody's heart is released. People are so confused and no amount of explanation can undo that confusion. People, especially adults, I think we get more and more confused as we grow older um, if we haven't found a true guru. You know, a child who is interested in some spiritual matters will ask a question, and I've never heard a child's question last more than 10 seconds. They're succinct, clear, to the point, you know exactly what they're asking, may not know how to answer it, but you know what they're asking. <laughs> Adults sometimes ask questions that are like themselves lectures. <laughs> you don't know where it began and where it ended. It's like a, the, the question itself is the very representation. It conjures up that image of that granthi avidya. It gives a, a vision of like a tangled ball of thread and you don't know where to start pulling. Like, what was the question? And how do I start unraveling this mess? That's what we all carry around inside of us until that point that we actually meet the true Guru. The true Guru doesn't even have to look for the end of the thread and start unspooling that, that knot. The Guru's words are so powerful, they can just dissolve the whole thing. Maharaji gives a couple of examples. He says, the words of a learned person who is not God-realized, so is not the uh, bearer of that grace, graceful power of God, that Kripa Shakti, they may speak logical words and those words may be very impressive, but they have no spiritual power within them. So the, the words of a learned person who is not God-realized are like the check of a person who has zero, a zero balance in their bank account. But they have a checkbook. They can write checks all day long but the, the impact or the power of those checks is nothing. So that can actually be felt in the words of the Guru. The Guru's words may or may not be eloquent. The true divine power is not in the beauty of the words, but in the divine status of the one speaking the words. So those words have the bank account balance to back up the check that's being written. Or another way, another analogy Sri Maharaji gives is the difference between firing blanks or firing real bullets. The blanks also make the same amount of noise as the real bullet does, but the blank has no power of penetration. The real bullet can penetrate. So that's the, the the power of the Divine Guru's words can penetrate that knot of ignorance and dissolve that. All the intellectual confusions that people carry around with them, you can spend all day answering their questions and they'll be no further ahead than they were before, but a few words from a Divine Saint and all of a sudden their eyes are opened and that knot of ignorance is gone. What happened? All of a sudden, tears are coming from their eyes when they think of Radha Krishna. And ten minutes ago, they were asking the most confused, intellectual, almost uh, offensive question. And a few words from the Guru cleared that up, and they don't, they don't even know what happened. Where did my confusion go? I don't even know what I was asking. What was wrong with me? Only the power of the saint can impact somebody that way. But not everybody is impacted that way. Just as we say, 
a nail can easily be driven into the soft soil, but can, no matter how hard you hammer it, it can't be driven into a rock. So if someone is really not receptive to the teachings or words of a divine saint, then even that saint cannot penetrate the, the hardness of that person's heart. But if someone is the least bit receptive, the least bit humble to receive the grace and teachings of the saint, then the saint's words have that divine power. So this is the meaning of this first line that we'll be singing. This granthi, granthi means the knot, and avidya means of ignorance. Jal means like a tangled, tangled knot, a web or a tangled knot. So chutat just releases or dissolves that tangle of spiritual confusion. Shri
That kripa shakti is experienced as the loosening of the knot of ignorance. This is the very definition of guru given in the Ved. Grinati jnanam iti guru, girati agyanam iti guru. What does guru mean? The one who <coughs> imparts knowledge, not just in the form of words, but actually in your heart, gives you the experiential knowledge. And the one who removes ignorance is the Guru. In the next line, Sri Maharaji says that the grace of the Guru can also be experienced in this way, that even in this age of Kali, the age of materialism, which has such a devastating effect on the mind of ordinary people, even during Kali Yuga, it's possible for a person to be inclined towards God. Imagine. There are three guna of Maya, Sattva Raj Tam. Those three qualities are also embedded in our mind. Our mind is made of those three qualities. Everybody's mind is. And as the four yugas go around, from Satyu to Treta to Dwapar and finally to Kali, but then back to Satyu. From Satyu on down, the good quality, Satvagun, starts reducing and Rajogun and Tamogun start increasing. So in Satyu, Satvagun is much more. In Treta Yug, Sattvagun comes down and Rajagun and Tamagun rise up maybe one quarter. In Dwapar Yug they almost even out. And in Kali Yug, Rajagun and Tamagun are much more than Sattvagun. We see it in society, we're much uh, more vocal and, and you know, we, we notice it in society and we talk about it, we gripe about it, that, you know, the state of the world, look at all the unrest and strife and suffering in the world. But the fact is our mind isn't, isn't in any better shape than the world. Our, the, the society is just a reflection of our inner states of mind. That's why the society is like that, because our mind is like that. So in Kali Yuga, everybody's mind experiences that shift where Rajogun, which causes the agitation and the increased appetite for the enjoyments of the senses, and Tamogun, which makes us lazy, careless, hateful, angry, these two qualities of the mind increase exponentially in Kali Yuga. We experience that. In Kali Yuga, the drive for wealth, fame, power, sensual pleasures just takes over the mind and becomes the apparent goal of our existence. And we see that in society. And yet, amidst such conditions, not only of our own mind, but of the surrounding atmosphere and environment of the society, even amidst such materialistic conditions, there are still some people who are inclined towards God, who are willing to make some sacrifices of their worldly pleasures or are willing to realize that material enjoyments don't give perfect happiness and actually dedicate time to surrender their mind to God. How unlikely is that? Well, it's only possible through the grace of the Guru. So all of us have been impacted 
by the grace of a divine saint, otherwise it would be impossible for our mind to even spend an hour thinking of Radha Krishna in this Kali Yuga. So Sri Maharaj Ji writes, Jinike Varad Hasta, because of his strong, gracious hand on your head, Chala Na Chal Kali Kalaki, the effect of Kali Yuga is actually mitigated to some extent or to a great extent. Otherwise, what would be our state? We would also be blindly running after all the worldly pleasures, desperately seeking name and fame and power in every which way. No matter how much harm we cause to others, uncaring for the long-term consequences or what kind of punishment we may have to receive in the future, we would be oblivious and careless. And we are sometimes, but to a great extent, we have been spared the effect of Kalyu in our mind. Not completely, we're still Compared to other yugas, we're still quite lazy and careless and all of those things. But as compared to what would be our mental state in Kalyu, if it weren't for the grace of the Guru, no, we've been spared to a great extent the impact of Kalyu on the human mind. So this is another amazing effect of the grace, the Kripa of the Guru which we have all experienced in our own life. Shri
Everybody is afraid of Maya because Maya is so powerful. Even the minds of great yogis and jnanis get deluded and the progress that they've made gets lost because Maya attracts them in one way or another. They end up falling for that and they lose their progress and they fall back into Mayak existence. But the devotees who are under the protection of the true Guru, they are spared the effect of Maya. Just as they are spared the effect of Kalyu, Jinnake Banat means with the Guru's grace, we've made some progress. Bigari Sakatanahi, Maya isn't allowed to spoil that progress. The Guru's grace has released that knot of ignorance. The Guru's grace has developed some bhav in our heart. Yet we're surrounded by maya and our mind is mayak and our mind is full of all kinds of attachments. So how are we to survive? How are we to manage to avoid the pitfalls of mayak life and keep progressing in devotion when we're surrounded by maya, we're pervaded by maya, our mind itself is maya and full of maya attachments and desires. But not to worry. As long as our mind remains surrendered to the guru, as we said in the previous verse, sanmuk, we have to keep our heart, mind, faith towards the Guru, no matter how weak we are, no matter how <clears throat> unqualified we are, or incapable we are, it doesn't matter. As long as we keep that in our mind that I am yours, I belong to you, so he has to protect us. He has to keep his gracious hand upon our head. So the effect of that is that the, even the most simple devotee has the full protection of the Guru to the extent of our faith and surrender. The mind after all is ours, we're independent to do what we want with it, and think what we want with it, so if one willfully turns away from the Guru then there's nothing the Guru can do to help us. But as long as we are turned towards the Guru, the Guru will protect our progress and ensure our further progress. Yoga Chemam Baham Yaham. To whatever extent we're surrendered to the Guru, the Guru actually insulates us from the effect of Maya, even though we're living in the Maya world with a Maya mind. Another way of explaining surrender is to think about seva, dedication. To what extent are we dedicated to the saint? We may think we're dedicated, but when tough times come along, then we see our true colors. There was a divine saint, a guru, named Amar Das, and he was more than 105 years old. He had quite a few disciples and his disciples used to think that uh, when Guruji passes on, he's going to name one of us as his successor. So I've been with him for so many years, I've served him for so many years, perhaps he'll name me as his successor. So one day Guruji decided to create such a situation where these disciples would see their own shortcomings in terms of surrender and dedication. So he told them, instructed all of his disciples, that uh, I want you all individually to build a platform, meaning out of the dirt, maybe some bricks and maybe a bit of wood, whatever, just find some way of building a nice proper platform. So all of the disciples went out and started working and building their platforms. 
Guruji came around and one by one he disapproved each of them. He said, this is no good, this is no good, this is no good, and he told every single disciple, break it and start again, build another one. So they all broke their platforms and started from scratch and built another one. Guruji came around again and said, no, no good, break it, smash it, no, get rid of this, start again, <coughs> over and over and over again. So after several times like this, these disciples were at their wit's end, what does he want? I don't know how to please him. He's just, no matter how well I build it, he's telling me it's no good and smash it again and start again. So they started thinking in their mind that maybe Guruji has lost his mind. I mean, he's over a hundred years old, maybe he's just not thinking straight. And then that thought turned into whispers and discussions. And after many, many times of building and smashing their platforms, the disciples all decided, you know what, we give up. This is useless. This is crazy. He has lost his mind and we're crazy to be following him. But one disciple, Ramdas, even though the other, all the other so-called disciples were encouraging him also to join them, he said, no, no, no. There's one thing I've learned, it's that Guru is the very form of God. Sakchat Bhagwan. And if Guru's mind is not straight, then whose mind is going to be right? <laughs> if we're not willing to accept that Guru's mind is correct, then who would have a correct mind? No, even if Guruji makes me keep building platforms and tearing them down for the rest of my life, that is what I will do. So he alone kept building, and when Guruji would come and tell him to, smash his platform and start again. Seventy times! Until finally Guruji was pleased by his bhakti, his seva, his dedication and devotion. And he embraced him and said, you alone are qualified to be my successor. So we see when difficult situations arise or something that doesn't appeal to our way of thinking, then we see our true colors, we see our true level of spiritual advancement. How much does it take to make our faith waver? How much does it take for our surrender to start to ebb? Then we see, oh, this is really where I am. I thought I was a really surrendered devotee. I thought I was a, a really good seva. But this situation really showed me my true status, that I still have a long way to go. But that kind of dedication can be worked on through understanding our shortcomings, admitting them, trying to improve our humbleness and praying to our Guru to grace us to become more humble, more surrendered and dedicated, we can develop that type of dedication that that true disciple Ram Das had for his Guruji. So, based on the extent of our surrender and dedication, we receive the Guru's grace, which is also experienced as protection which protects us from the effects of Kalyug and from the effects of Maya. Shri
two lines explain about the ultimate thing that we can receive through the Guru's grace if we completely join our heart and mind with the Guru. The next line says, Jinnike Yuga Charana Parasatta Man. The one who touches the lotus feet of the Guru with their mind, not with their body, not with their head or their hands, Parasatta Man, the mind, the heart, has to touch the feet of the Guru. Many of us may have touched the physical divine feet of the divine saint, but none of us has actually joined our mind with the lotus feet of the Guru. If we do that, if we completely surrender our heart and mind to the Guru like Ram Das, then Pavata Rati Nandalalaki. Rati means the intimate, the most intimate form of divine bliss, the divine love of Radha Krishna. Satam Prasanga. The Bhagavatam explains that through joining one's mind with the Guru, tad joshana, completely joining the mind with the Guru results in three things. First of all, shraddha. Shraddha means desire for God faith in God and desire for God, coupled with renunciation from the world, which comes through receiving correct knowledge. So we get that by associating with the Guru, and then once one understands the true aim of life, then rati comes. Rati means ruchi, the desire to do devotion in order to attain God. And finally, through the Guru's grace, we start to experience bhakti, in other words, bhav bhakti. We start to experience affinity for Radha and Krishna in our heart, not just an intellectual understanding that they are mine, but the actual feeling in the heart that they are mine and I belong to them. True love starts to blossom in the heart with the grace of the Guru. And as that devotee continues to practice devotion and become more and more surrendered to the Guru, in the end, with the Guru's grace, they will receive the true rati and the true bhakti, which is that divine power of Sri Krishna, the essence of Alladini Shakti, which, is, which can only be received in a divine heart. And once is received, is enjoyed forever, the ultimate form of divine bliss. And having received that divine bliss, the devotee also gets to see and take part in the leelas of Radha and Krishna. Lakhat kripalu anugraha guru ke leela lari ki. Where are those leelas? One time, Sri Krishna's great-grandson, Vajranab, asked Shandilya Maharshi. Well, first he asked Parikshit. And Parikshit brought him to Shandili Maharshi to get the answer. Krishna's son, Pradyumna, had a son, Anirudh, who had a son, Vajranab, Sri Krishna's great-grandson. 
Although Parichit was the emperor of the entire earth after Arjun, Yudhishthira, and the other Pandavas left for the divine abode, Parichit was left in charge. But he had kings who ruled under him. So the area of Braj was given to Sri Krishna's great grandson, Vajranab, to rule. One day Vajranab went and visited his uncle Parichit, who was like a father to him, and he asked him, My dear father, why is there nobody in my kingdom? I am the king of Braj. I'm the king of this Mathura district, but there's no Praja. <laughs> there's nobody living in my kingdom. Where did they all go? So that's when Parikshit said, okay, I think we better go get the answer from a great Rishi named Shandilya Maharshi. So Shandilya Maharshi said that when Radha and Krishna disappeared from this earth, all the gopis and gwadavals went with them. Leaving Braj devoid of human habitation and the jungle just took over. So where did they go? Shandili Maharshi explained that there are two kinds of leelas. There are the vastavi leelas which are always happening in the divine world which is omnipresent in this world but which can only be seen with divine eyes. And then there are the Vyavahariki Leelas, which Radha Krishna make visible to even material eyes when they take what we call avatar on this earth. They make themselves visible and they make their Leelas visible here on earth. Of course, you would need divine eyes to appreciate them and experience the blissfulness of them, but even without divine eyes, you could actually see the Leelas. So those Vastavi Leelas, which are happening eternally and omnipresently, they can only be seen with divine eyes. But the Vyavahariki Leelas can be seen by everyone, even though they wouldn't be understood or appreciated by everyone. So right now, Radha Krishna are not taking avatar on this earth. This is, they're not making their Vyavahariki Leelas visible to us. But the Vastavi Leelas are always happening, everywhere, all the time. But you need divine eyes to see them. How do you get those divine eyes? Through the grace of the Guru. So when one completely surrenders themselves to the Guru, with the Guru's grace, the veil of Maya is removed and the Swarup Shakti is given, which causes our senses to become divine and then lo and behold, we see that those divine Leelas of Radha Krishna were always happening all around us, but we were oblivious to them. But now we see them with the grace of the Guru. So this is a very brief explanation of the greatness and importance of the grace of the Guru in this beautiful Pad Kirtan written by Sri Maharaji. We'll understand more about this in the upcoming lectures in this weekend intensive. And now we'll sing these last couple lines. Shri
Welcome to our Mon Sadhana Intensive, where we're going, we are commemorating the auspicious occasion of the disappearance or ascension day of Jagat Guru Sri Paluji Maharaj. In tomorrow's lecture, I'll be talking more about seva and dedication and surrender to the Guru and what that means. And on the last day, Sunday morning, I'll be talking about how to recognize a Guru. We'll have more uh, of the general public here during that time, so it'll be more of a general talk. But tomorrow will be specifically about seva and surrender. So, just a few guidelines for the weekend. Of course, maun sadhana means no talking. You're allowed to chant God's name as loudly as you want here in the hall, but no talking during the breaks or even during seva. You, if you need to communicate something, use your phone and write it on your phone and show it to the person or write it on a piece of paper. So there shouldn't be any talking. There's really no excuse. There's no unless there's an emergency that arises, you can always take a minute and write it down. And di even if you have to discuss, you can do it by writing it. You discuss things through text messages all the time. So you can text in person, but no talking. Whispering also doesn't count. Sometimes people think if they're whispering, it's okay. No, even whispering is considered talking. So that's called Upanshu Varni. Still Varni. So use the written word or don't speak at all. That doesn't, a lot of people think or they used to think that, okay, silent intensive means we're, we're not going to be having lectures or kirtan or anything. No, we'll be having lectures and kirtan and during the breaks, kirtan will be playing on the speakers as well. Object is not to live in silence, but to give this a break have no unnecessary talking, in fact, no talking, only the chanting of God's divine name. So we can all be introverted. We just had a wonderful sadhana shivir in Mangar, more than a month, almost five weeks of sadhana, as we do at this time every year. And this year with the uh, inspiration of the Didis, the sadhana was a full moan sadhana, as it used to be back in the early days when Maharaji would demand that of the participants. So things had relaxed a little bit over the years, but uh, even though people were still encouraged to follow that, at this time the Didis made a special request and everybody made a special effort. And it was a really beautiful experience. People followed it very seriously and maintained silence for the entire month. So we can do that for a couple of days here at Radha Madhavdham, as we have been doing for the last few years, every year when we have this intensive. So remain introverted, just keep remembering Radha Krishna's name, keep doing Radha breathing, and you'll get maximum benefit from the weekend.